light production. And to talk about production and deployment, we have lovely Katie who will describe how to host our code when we have written it awesomely. Over to you, Katie. Hello, I'm Katie, as I was introduced, and this is What is Deployment Anyway? But this isn't the talk you're probably expecting. This isn't going to be the one true way to do production deployments. No talk can give you that, no matter what they say on the tin. This also isn't going to be a talk about how to take your proof of concept VC funded startup and turn it into the next big dot com. If you want to talk about that, here is my work email. Today, these discussions are going to be talking about the minimum number of things you need to do in order to host your website. This is about taking your cool little Django blog application that you've made on your local machine. Maybe you've just finished the Django Girls tutorial or something like that, and you want to be able to share it with someone else on the internet. This talk is going to answer the, title po the question posed in the title, what? is deployment anyway? More specifically, what is Django deployment? Because Django deployment is complicated. Um, we're going to be focusing on the what. Here, there's a whole bunch of other things we could talk about, but I've only got half an hour. We're going to briefly mention some of the where and how, but we're mainly going to focus on the what. The talk and the code examples are specifically going to be for Django 4.1 and Python 3.10 as these are the most current minor versions of both these things available at the time. If you're joining me on the recording from 2029, I'm sorry, this is probably going to be out of date. Um, hopefully, you'll still learn something. All right, so let's start by taking a look at Django, what it gives you out of the box. And if you haven't created a new template project in Django for a while, hopefully, this will be a lovely reminder. So in my terminal, if I want to install Django, I'll probably run something like pip install Django. And then pip will go off, and it will go, OK, I'll install Django for you and some of its base dependencies. Cool. And then if I want to start a new project, I can use the Django admin CLI that was just installed for me and use its start project template function. I'll call it my project, and I'll create it in the current folder. And what that will do is set up a base Django project for me. I can see that there's a manage.py file in there, and then a folder called my project, which has got a whole bunch of interesting files in there, including a settings.py, a asgi.py, a wsgi.py, and a urls.py. Cool. So if I clear my terminal, I can just start up Django, which will be very upset at me and have this wonderful red warning that I haven't done database things. But it helpfully tells me exactly what I need to do to fix that. Cool. So I'll go clear my terminal and run this manage.py migrate function. And that'll go, and that'll have a whole bunch of green, so I feel much more confident that I've done everything right. And if I check my folder, I've now got this new db.sqlit3 file. Huh. So if I go and try to run run server again, I no longer get a red warning of doom, so that's lovely. And it helpfully tells me that there's now something running. If I go to this website, I get the wonderful rocket ship of success. I also now, now know that I should have a Django admin, which shows up, but I don't have a username or password yet. So let's go back to the terminal, clear everything up. And then I want to run the create super user management command where I will give it a username, my email address, a super secure secret password, twice, and then I'll have a super user. Then if I start my run server again, go back to the website, enter in my super long password that's absolutely not admin admin, and then I have a Django admin. Success! I have just deployed a Django on my machine. Django has a really, really great local development story. We can get our app up and running really fast with a database, all down to the power of Run Server. Run Server runs our application for us, and it also does nice things like automatically restart itself when we start changing some of our Django files and when we start editing our code. The Django documentation describes what Run Server does. 
The Django Docs, as has been described by a number of talks at this conference already, is really great. However, if you're newer to Django or tech in general, some of the docs might seem a little bit hard to understand. I know that only a couple of years ago, I was looking at the Django docs going, I don't understand this. It looks like documentation, but I can't parse it. But this is why I'm here, so I'm going to help you parse some of the base Django docs that you're going to um, end up finding when you want to start thinking about deployment. So looking at the Django documentation, there is this thing where we can look up in the search, run server, and it says that run server starts a lightweight development web server on your local machine. And then it says in big capital letters, do not run run server in production. OK? If I ever see you running run server in production, I will find you. Run server has not gone through any security audits or performance tests. It is not secure. And that's the way it's going to stay because we, the Django web framework, is in the business of making web frameworks, not web servers. Django is an extremely stable, production-ready web framework. Django is very, very good at being a web framework. The fact that it gives you a local web server to get you started and in that development loop of automatically restarting is fantastic. It is also very, very good that it calls out its limitations. We are going to need to find a different web server if we're going to deploy to production, because otherwise, I will be very upset at you. The documentation we just saw, though, brought up some more terms, like what is production anyway? And also, and this question has stumped many a developer that I've asked it to, why is it called production? Historically, when computers were based on punch cards, you might say it was a production line to go and process data through machines. You had to physically move different things around like an assembly line. Sort of like in manufacturing, you have a car and it adds the things as you go along. That would be a production line. You could also think of it nowadays as a stage production, a theatrical performance, where you have your stage and you want to make sure that there is enough space for all the people to come and see what you want to show making sure that you have the capacity at your venue, making sure you have the seating and all the uh, catering and stuff, that is going to be your production setup so everyone can see your wonderful thing that you want to show off. This is a metaphor. Not only is Run Server a great development web server, but it also serves the images, CSS, and JavaScript that comes with the base Django template application because if we didn't have CSS and that kind of the pretty things for this Django admin that comes bulk standard in Django, you would end up getting something that looks very 1997. Now, this login form for the Django admin will still work because web accessibility. However, you can tell something hasn't been set up right. Collectively, all these different styling files are known as static. But why is it called static? Well, static, the verb meaning it's unchanging. These things don't normally change between, uh, it, it, once you release something, they probably don't change between releases as opposed to your moving data, your user uploaded media. That's probably going to keep changing a bit. But these are going to be static, and it means that we can take different mechanisms to make sure that we're doing lovely things like caching and other things to help our performance later. If we have a look, though, at what that login screen has underneath, we can see that it's specifically referencing the static files. In there, there's a base.css, there's a navbar, nav sidebar.json. That's all the static, and that is all being served for us by the run server command. The Django documentation describes that, again, Using run server and using the static serving is not suitable for production. And if I see you doing this, I will find you. But run server is going to be specifically serving these files if we're in debug mode. 
well, we've got to be in debug mode, right? Because our login was looking OK. So how do we make sure that we're in debug mode? Well, this is where we start looking at some of those template files that were created for us. If we remember, we have a look at our file listing, and we can see that we have a settings.py here underneath our My Project folder. And if we open that up, half of this file is going to be documentation in the form of doc strings, which is actually going to be really useful once you start stepping through and reading what it's suggesting. Particularly, half the comments are saying, do not use this in production, and yet it works on our local machine. And if you don't understand what you're doing, you're not going to understand what these settings are doing. You're not going to change them. And you're going to be running these settings in production, which I will find you. Great audience participation. I miss live conferences. These warnings just keep going. This file is real long, and it's got all these different security warnings after security warnings in here. These settings all work great for a local development environment. And it's completely understandable that if you don't understand, you're just going to keep them there. But this lack of knowledge, if this is the first time you're hearing these terms, considering putting your website on the internet, that's because if you've developed an application, if you have developed Django, you're a Django developer. You're not a server operations person. You're not a system administrator. You're not a network engineer. You're a developer. There's entire different specializations of software engineering and computer science involved in some of these. And so that's the entire reason I'm giving this talk, to try to demystify some of those for you. Ah, look there. It says that debug is set to true. Cool. All right. We can also see here that we've got this weird thing in here about databases. And we can see that there's this db.sqlite3 setting in here. But what's this SQLite 3 thing? To the documentation. The documentation says that SQLite is an excellent development alternative. Again, this word, development. SQLite is very good for applications that are predominantly read-only or require a smaller installation footprint. Again, that word, development. Django has a very good local development story. And you saw just how quickly we got it all working on our local machine. But to get our site from our local machine into production is going to be complex, because as we've discovered together, you're going to need to provide your own web server. You're not going to be using run server, because if you do, I will find you. Yes! Oh, don't make me find you. You're going to need your own web server. You're going to need your own database. And you're going to need a static host. And if you aren't familiar with the production grade offerings out there, you'll end up confused. Or worse, I will find you because you'll be running web run server in production. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, but Katie, Flask isn't this hard. I can do things really easy with Flask. Well, let's talk about that. Flask is a lot simpler in production. A lot of deployment tutorials that you'll see where they say how to deploy Python into production often use Flask as the target. Just copy and paste your code. It's easy. Just use REPL. It's great. This is true, because you can get an out-of-the-box Hello World application running quite easily on a number of different hosting platforms using Flask. The issue that Django has is one of state. Django is a stateful application. It is full of state, as in it contains information in our database that we really want to keep a hold of and not lose. It would be really sad if our database went away. You've probably got a copy of your code on GitHub on your local machine. You probably have a copy in your downloads file of whatever stock footage, uh, photos you're using for placeholders. You probably got copies of all that stuff. You probably don't have a copy of your production database anywhere. The absolute bare bones Django application has a Django admin. The Django admin requires a database. Just just tore your username, a hash of your password, session information. Therefore, a basic Django application requires a database. Therefore, a Django application requires state. Now, 
a Hello World Flask application need not have a database. You can absolutely add a database. There was a tutorial earlier this week about doing just that. But you can have Flask with a database, but you can't really have Django without a database. Django does a really good production-ready set of things to do with databases. And if you don't have a database, Django's a little bit overkill. So any application with state is going to be complex. Django is going to be complex. Let me share with you another gem from the docs. Earlier, I said in this section, there's this uh, link to deploying static files. And this deploying static files page has a whole list of different strategies, but it also has this one line I want to point out. As with all deployment tasks, the devil's in the detail. Every production setup will be a little bit different. Every single production setup will be a little bit different. This line has been in the Django documentation for 13 years now plus, and it still holds true. I've never seen two production setups that are identical. Most every deployment talk you'll see will include the line, it depends, by telling you the one true way to do deployments. There is a talk from a previous PyCon called The One True Way to Do Deployments. A lot of that information might not be the most uh, accurate anymore because things change. Because it, everything does depend. But I'm not going to use this line. I'm going to use this line. I'm a sysadmin. I'm not your sysadmin. While I will find you if you use run server in production, I'm not going to be the one that's woken up at 3 AM if your production website goes down, unless you pay me. Any recommendations I make in this talk are just that. They're recommendations. Recommendations based on my own experience. It's up to you and your team to understand what you're doing, because you're the ones that are going to have to maintain your website and fix it when it's broken. That being said, Let's go through and have a look at what options we have as of the year of our dog 2022 for a production grade web server database and static. Django has support for a number of the most common of these. And this is really going to help us here. Because this is where we can move out of the scope of what do I need for Django to go into what do I need for web? Because heaven forbid, uh, there are other web frameworks apart from Django. And so there are going to be more people who want to deploy web frameworks. And if we can all use common things, we can build the best of breed for a web server, for a database that's not going to be Django specific. And so we're going to be able to rely on the work of others and bring that into our systems. So if we're going to talk about Flask, we know that it's simpler in production. But that's because you're not going to need a database or a static host for Flask. You're just going to need that web server. And the reason you can get Flask up and running really easily, because it's more easier now than ever to get a simple hosting site set up where all you need is a web server. If we have a look at the Flask documentation, there doesn't need to be any highlighting here from me, because the Flask documentation already has in bold that the built-in web server is not suitable for production. But they also list a whole bunch of different hosting options on their website. These links all go out to various hosting vendor documentation and will show you step by step how to do it for their particular platform. This isn't a complete list, of course. The host you use, the web hosting provider, the cloud provider, whatever they call themselves, is going to be based on a few factors. What platform do you already know? If you don't have to learn a new one, it's going to be faster for you. What platform do you and your team already know? What have you been paid to use before? What do you know how to use? Or what do you want to learn if you're doing this for your own hobby thing? This can be an excuse for you to try something different. There are going to be different options for each different hosting provider you use. Um, some of them will have everything for you where you just provide a copy of your Django code and it'll do everything else. But others, you have to do a lot more. It's going to depend on the host of choice. A lot of the base options for you are going to handle things for you, like auto-scaling or HTTPS and SSL certification by default. You can, of course, do it all yourself if you're an old school person who knows how to do the Nginx dance or the Apache Samba and everything else you need to do to get it working on a virtual machine. That's what you know. 
that will get you up and running fastest because you don't have to learn anything new. But if you don't happen to be a 10 year in industry network system administrator already, if you happen to be just a Django developer starting out, you do not have to learn how to use Nginx and Apache and all the different tools that I hope you don't already know. Some of this stuff is confusing for me and I've been in this industry nearly 20 years. I hope you couldn't hear me in the mic mumbling how old I am. Cool. Hosting options are always ever evolving. I'm not gonna tell you which one you should use, but the best practices will change over time and the hosting places will have up-to-date documentation to tell you what they recommend that you do. I should know because I wrote all the Django documentation for my particular host. Um, a lot of them will tell you how to get started or they might show you more complicated things, but it will depend on who you choose. But let's continue with the what though. The Flask documentation mentions this WSGI thing, which we saw way back ago in the Django documentation. There was this thing about a WSGI application thing, which was way back in our settings file that mentions a WSGI thing, and way back in our file listing there was a WSGI thing. This WSGI file, half of its comments, and all it is is just making sure that there's a application uh, module level variable. And this documentation link, here is going to be really helpful as well because that's going to link out to tell you what WSGI is. But what is WSGI? Well, WSGI is a common Python web server gateway interface. It's going to go from the networking side into your Django side, and it's going to be the fuzzy logic in between that you really don't have to care about apart from the fact that you need to know that WSGI is a thing that you need to clip your Legos together for. The PEP 333, now 3333 because Python 3 because too many threes. Um, it is, this PEP specifically defines a proposed standard interface but to get all these things working together, which means that because this standard exists, there's a whole bunch of different WSGI web servers that are gonna talk the same language and so you can choose which one's right for you. I will quickly mention that asynchronous support is ever evolving in Django. Unless you're doing async things, please ignore this for now. It's really complicated. And also it's still evolving. Only in the release two weeks ago did they introduce asynchronous handlers for class-based views. It is not all the way in the Django stack yet. If you can avoid ASGI, please do. We're gonna stick to WSGI. So, we need a WSGI server. Great, which WSGI server? I use G-Unicorn because its avatar is a unicorn. Um, G-Unicorn is one of the most stable, longest uh, supported WSGI web servers out there. Um, and it has also had security reviews, which is pretty good. You can install as a Python package and then you can just go G-Unicorn run and get your application started. Because if we install this and run it in a terminal, we want to reference the myproject.wizgi colon application, and then it'll start up. Same URL as last time, same rocket ship as last time, except our admin looks very 90s. Um, but we know because of our previous discussions, that's because we're not doing anything with static. Indeed, G-Unicorn will give us errors that it's not doing it static. We're gonna need to find something else to do the static because G-Unicorn is just a whiskey web server and it doesn't do static. So, we're gonna use G-Unicorn. How we use G-Unicorn, how we invoke that is gonna depend on your server hosting provider of choice. It could be something as simple as if you're working in containers, specifying G-Unicorn as your entry point. If you're using virtual machines, uh, getting G-Unicorn running in a process manager of some kind. But this is a how, this is a what talk, not a how talk. And I've only got five minutes left and the rest of this is going to reference other talks that are themselves half an hour long. So it's okay, you're not gonna have to pull me off stage. It's fine. Um, so, now that we have a web server, we're gonna need to do something about the database and the static. If you have no other 
things that are driving you towards any other database, please just use Postgres. It'll make your life so much easier. Um, unless your team happens to have experience in another database, just use Postgres. And I say this because Postgres from the last two Django de developer surveys is the most popular database. The documentation says it's the most popular database with the most support. That's probably a really good idea of where your eggs should go in which basket. But specifically, there has been a lot of contributions to the Django Contrib Postgres um, sub package thing, words, the module. Um, there has been a lot of customization to this module, so Postgres users have the most to gain. If you're a MySQL person, if you're another database person, and there are specific features that you want, contribute them back into Django so more, so more people can use your database of choice. But right now, just use Postgres. Um, so how do we get Postgres working? Well, we're going to have to go in and edit our settings file, because we know that we were previously using SQLite. We're going to want to change that to Postgres. And depending on your hosting platform, there's probably going to be like a click button get Postgres database option. They're going to then provide you with a host name for your service, for your server instance, a port that you can connect to, and probably a name of the database within that instance. Pop those in your settings file. Do not ever pop your username and password into your settings file because I will find you and I will teach you about how to do this correctly. Um, your hosting provider may allow you to reference these values as encrypted environment variables. Please do this. You really don't want to be hard coding things into your files. Um, there is a wonderful package that can help you do this called Django Environ. If you're familiar, uh, who is familiar with .env files? Excellent. Django Environ will let you slurp those up, and it'll automatically pop those into your environment for you. So instead of having to have five separate environment variables, you just have one, which is the relative location or contents of that file. This is going to implement something called 12-factor apps, which is an entirely separate talk in itself. But specifically, it's going to be helping us with um, things in general. Um, the web hosting provider is going to help with a whole bunch of other things for us. And it's going to make sure that your application can be deployed to many places if you're not putting any specific items in your code, which is going to help you make sure that you can have multiple copies of things around the place. There's a whole bunch of things that I could be talking a lot more about, and I'm already running out of time. Please come talk to me in the grassy area outside afterwards, because I can talk about this stuff for hours. Um, so if you want to be using something like Django Environ, you'd create a .env file, you'd install Django Environ, and you'd change your uh, settings file to instead of referencing os.environ.get, you'd reference the helper method.env. And then you'll be able to pick up all your settings, and your code looks a whole lot cleaner. So we're going to be using Postgres and Django Environ. When that will help you with your database. When you apply migrations, like we did earlier, is going to depend on a whole bunch of different things. I highly recommend that you look at a wonderful gentleman, uh, Marcus Holterman's talks and blogs about how to write migration files. You can automatically create migrations, but you may want to manually write migrations. Um, and you're going to be applying those with the command migrate that we did earlier. I am well, running well over time. Do not use me as a reference on how to give talks good. Um, but for static, um, your hosting provider of choice is going to have an option for static, and you're probably going to be wanting to use Django Storages, which supports a number of different hosting providers. So all you have to do there is just probably pop something around where your static.url is to reference whatever settings you need. Um, and again, how to or when to run this is going to be a completely separate talk. Um, Jacob Kaplan Moss did a talk, Assets in Django Without Losing Your Hair. Um, I don't have that problem, thankfully. I just cut it all off. Um, but his talk references when to run collect static. 
So, hopefully I've helped dis uh, describe some of the base things that you may have seen pop up, some concepts that you may not be super familiar with. However, this is my list of things that I think you should be doing if you want to deploy Django, but keep in mind that this is as of mid-2022. Those people on the recording, this is timestamped information. None of this may be relevant tomorrow. Sorry. Um, and as I said, there's a whole bunch of things I didn't cover today. Each of these things are its own conference worth of stuff. So you can see why I didn't get a chance to cover all of them. Um, it's a lot. I'm sorry. There's a reason why people use run server in production is because it is easy. But you don't want me to find you. Cool. Um, if you want to talk about uh, doing this all with a particular hosting provider called Google, who is sponsoring, come talk to me afterwards. There's my work email. I've gone over. My MC is walking up the stairs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Katie.